Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Turn the Page. I'm your host today, Jen, and I'm here with the uh, an incredibly prolific author <laughs> of historical fiction uh, who is here with an absolutely uh, wonderful book that I am so excited to talk about. Could I ask you to introduce yourself and your book, please? Hi, Jen. I'm Christine Wells, and my book is called The Royal Windsor Secret, and it's about a young woman who grows up in Cairo in Egypt and comes to believe she's the secret illegitimate daughter of Edward VIII, who then went on to abdicate the throne and marry Wallace Simpson. Uh, and the book is about jewellery, it travels to Paris and London, and uh, there's just courtesans and royalty and lots of exotic locations. So it's all great fun, I think. It is great fun. And uh, before we get into the book itself, to specifically, uh, I'd love for if you could talk a little bit about uh, your path to the book. Um, where did your interest in historical fiction begin? And where did this particular project sort of originate from? It, my interest in historical fiction began from practically from birth. I mean, my father was a great historian and uh, he would tell me the stories behind the nursery rhymes you know, Mary, Mary, quite contrary was quite a bloody little tale uh, if you if you know the background to it. So from there, I started reading a lot of uh, children's fiction that was historical fiction. And I became obsessed with Elizabeth I because, of course, she's this strong woman ahead of her time from history who really uh, confounded all of the men around her who were trying to get her to marry and so forth. And uh, I think uh, my my interest in actually researching historical fiction came from this massive project we were given to do when I was about 12 or something. And uh, I researched uh, World War II. So my project was the, the rise and fall of Adolf Hitler. And uh, dad told, taught me how to research a historical uh piece so I read many books on the subject and really synthesized all of that and I think really him teaching me that skill was was how I came to learn how to do this and immerse myself in the history and so I've always had this love for historical fiction uh as far as this book goes I used to love or still do love the Amelia Peabody mysteries uh if you've ever read them they're just absolutely delightful it's about a, a Victorian lady who comes into a fortune and decides to travel to Egypt and she meets an, uh, a, an Egyptologist there and goes on digs and solves mysteries and they always stayed at this luxury hotel called Shepherd's Hotel in Cairo and that was a place where Everybody who was anybody would stay, Mark Twain, Noel Coward, uh, Rita Hayworth and the Aga Khan, all the royalty from Europe. People used to winter in Egypt to get away from the cold from Europe. Uh, so I was very intrigued by the hotel itself and I really wanted to set a story there. And it was really a couple of years before I stumbled across this uh, scandalous French courtesan called Marguerite Farmy, or she had several names, of course, because she was married and pretended to be married several times. And uh, she had had she she had been in Egypt. She had stayed often at Shepherd's Hotel, but in Paris, where she was from, she had also had an affair with Edward VIII. So. My, I was thinking, what if, what if there was a child from that liaison, and that's how the Royal Windsor Secret was born. It's really um, the deep historical background that you bring from your family is really evident here because it does. Um, 
you know, it, it balances being meticulously researched with being like really accessible and vivid, if that makes you know sense in a way. Like it combines the best of sort of like history as a discipline and then history as like a fun thing uh, as a, and a hobby, you know, kind of. <laughs> it's oh, uh, I, I'm so glad you said that because when people say, oh, it's just a light read, I, I think there's so much work that goes into making that an entertaining story you know I I do try to be historically accurate as far as possible and uh, so it's lovely to hear that because I do strive for that balance between a really entertaining story and and getting the history right. Mm. Um, you know for something like that I imagine when you are blending fiction and history with them, especially more on the modern side, you know, when you're dealing with very well documented people, you know, as a, as opposed to like the earlier eras, um, I bet a lot hinges sort of like on the, the protagonist, sort of like the, you know, the fictionalized insert who, for, from whom we see all of the activities of the book. So what for you went into crafting Cleo and uh, her perspective and sort of like, yeah, like her perspective on all of the things that happened to her? Well, to be honest, it's easier, I think, to write a fictional protagonist than it is to write one who is real. And I had both in in uh, The Royal Windsor Secret. So I wrote from the point of view of Marguerite as well, although she's not as, as heavily represented. It's really Cleo's story. And I think that the flexibility of a fictional character uh, is is much easier to handle as an author. You you have freedom about what their character is like and what they do and how they behave, uh, and then you can weave that in amongst the real history and the real people. So um, I I suppose I she she starts off very young in this book. So she's sixteen when it starts, and it it spans about three decades. So I was also had to be aware of how she matures along the way. And she's still herself, but she learns things and hopefully grows uh, in wisdom by the end. Mm, absolutely. Like her journey is really lovely. Um, I really particularly loved the childhood scenes because, as you say, the Shepherd's Hotel, which I had uh, never heard of before I read this book and now I am absolutely fascinated as well um it's such an interesting environment to imagine growing up in and you know it really sets the stage for you know a life of these brushes with um with you know royalty and fame and celebrity that are going to mark her entire life um when you are trying to um you know, choose the historical figures of, of, of you know with whom she's going to interact. Um, obviously some are necessary because of, you know, the story you've imagined, but then there's a huge, uh, you know, select uh, range of people um, for whom it would, would have been possible to her to, for her to meet, you know? Um, so what was your sort of inclusion process? Like, how did you pick the figures with whom she would interact? Oh, uh, I think whatever serves the story is really what I try to do. I, I knew Shepherd's Hotel is this uh, beautiful edifice. It's like it looks like a museum from the outside, and inside it's filled with Moroccan tiles and Egyptian motifs, and you know these wonderful uh, female they call them dancers, caryatids that flank the the staircase, and it's got an underground tunnel, just like in in the a uh, game clue, you know, <laughs> yeah, the, there's a tunnel that sort of bisects the the hotel. And so, uh, you know, I knew a lot of people who would have visited there at the time that uh, that she grew up there. But usually it's, uh, it's just what I need for the story. So uh, she wanted, Cleo wants to become a jewellery designer. Mm -hmm. And so she... Me, she wants to to desperately to meet the people at Cartier because that's where she wants to be a designer, and so because she is uh, staying with a very wealthy widow in Paris, she gets taken to Cartier and meets Jean Toussaint, 
who was the creative director at Cartier at the time and, you know, a really groundbreaking woman in that respect because like perfume, like fashion, uh, jewellery was the province of men. <laughs> it's, right. it's so strange. They wouldn't let women in, really. So uh, she meets Jean Toussaint and then she meets Pierre Le Marchand, who uh, was the, one of the most famous designers of Cartier. He did the Panthers and he did uh, a lot of the jewellery that Wallace Simpson uh, was given by Edward VIII. So... Uh, it, it was really, you know, how, how can I believably get her to meet these people and what serves the story? Mm. And, you know, maybe there were parties where she went to at, on the Riviera or somewhere like that. There might have been famous people there too, but, you know, that was just because that was the circle she moved in. Mm. Um, they might pop up. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the glimpse into... Um, uh the jewelry making world, especially at the elite level that Cartier is working at was really fascinating too. And I, you know, I found, um, I was really taken sort of like with the conflict that she is experiencing throughout this, you know, because she has this sort of potential, uh, you know, royal uh, connection that would present one kind of opportunity for her, but would also really um, include a lot of uh, constraints that she currently doesn't really have in her life and that wouldn't suit her for, you know, wanting to pursue jewelry design or, or, you know, have a career with all of the different forces that are sort of pulling her in different directions. Well, I, I think that uh, Cleo doesn't care about the royalty aspect. She yeah. <laughs> really wants family, you know. She wants to know who her real parents are and she doesn't care if they're a prince or pauper she just wants that connection mm. and uh so the you know she's got this uh, love interest Brody and he's Scottish so he doesn't he has no time for royalty or anything like that and when she tells him she thinks she's the illegitimate daughter of Edward VIII he just goes oh so you're royalty now <laughs> you know <laughs> it, it's like not not this not this so uh, I think uh being brought up by a very independent woman, Cleo mm. um, didn't didn't care about royalty. Uh, a lot of the British arist aristocracy are very dismissive of their royal family because, partly because I think they feel like they're interlopers. You know, they they came from a German uh, royal line, and uh, a lot of the aristocrats in Britain have been there for longer than the. The Windsors, so uh, yeah, they they don't really they're not that impressed by the royalty, mm. uh, and I suppose she had grown up with people like that, and she she's a very she's really the heart of the book, and she's very led by her heart, and she just wants someone to love her. Mm. That's true. She does have a very pragmatic uh, reason for any contact that she has with the royals. And so navigating that, like, let's get close enough to get information, but not so close that, you know, <laughs> this becomes uh, a real force. I really love the aspect um, of her search for her parentage and sort of for an identity in that role. And her journeys to France are particularly fascinating. Um, so just as I was not familiar with the Shepherd's Hotel, I was also not familiar with this courtesan, uh, Marguerite uh, Miller, or whatever, you know, last name she has at the moment. Um, yeah, could you talk a little bit more about maybe where you uh, encountered her and like what it was like to fictionalize somebody who is, um, you know, uh, I don't know, as, as as interesting and mysterious a figure as that. I, I think the challenge with Marguerite was that she behaved so outrageously that uh, it's actually not all that believable <laughs> <laughs> that she did all of these things. And thank goodness for the author's note because uh, I do explain that every outrageous thing she does in the book, she actually did that or something similar in real life. Mm. Uh but uh, she, I discovered her, I, I am a former lawyer, so uh, part of my thing with, book, with historical fiction has often been to include a legal, legal thread in, in my stories. Mm -hmm. And I stumbled across a former judge, actually. He's a, a British 
a writer but uh, used to practice law and he he is concerned with writing about uh, miscarriages of justice throughout history and so uh, uh, Marguerite he wrote two books about Marguerite and the prince because the first book he wrote he didn't know the full story and then uh, Marguerite's grandson contacted him and said you do know <laughs> that uh, she had an affair with Edward VIII and uh, she you know this this she well I won't spoil it but she was charged with murder <laughs> at, at the Savoy Hotel so she, there was a trial in London and uh, Edward VIII is suspected to have been involved with her acquittal so uh, this was the miscarriage of justice that, uh, that that Andrew Rose, his name is, uh, wrote about in his book. So I, I was intrigued by Marguerite from all sorts of angles because she 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 fitted in with the jewelry, she loved jewels. The way the way she amassed her fortune was through receiving gifts from men in the traditional way that French courtesans did. Uh, they didn't get paid in money, they got paid in jewels and it was all very, uh, you know, was was considered vulgar to be paid in cash but mm. jewels were acceptable and then they might sell the jewels or, you know, wear them to to display how their, their status. So it was a symbol to other men, this is what I'm worth, <laughs> this is what you have to give me to to be my escort uh so so she was really a perfect person to write about but she wasn't a very admirable person so I needed Cleo to be the real protagonist of the story because uh Marguerite is certainly not a sympathetic character and really I couldn't rewrite history to make her so <laughs> <laughs> yeah that is really fascinating um I, one of the things that I really appreciate, actually, uh, since we're talking about character, is that um, character is so important and there's a lot of rich development, as we've been talking about. And it's accompanied by uh, my favorite kind of plot, which is the sort of like the slow burn plot that's very internal and very much about like inner processes and people, you know, going through personal things rather than like, um, you know, action scenes and, you know, which are great, too, but it's a different kind of a different kind of fun um so i'm i'm curious about your approaches in general to plot and character and how you balance them and perhaps um if dif do different projects require different balances of plot and character i think they do i uh, this one i was really i really enjoyed that development of character and and being having the freedom with Cleo because she was fictional to really show all those stages. I wrote another book called One Woman's War, uh, which was about uh, Patty Bennett, who was the real Miss Moneypenny. She was the woman who was secretary to Ian Fleming, the author of the James Bond novels mm. uh, in World War II. And he was worked for Naval Intelligence. And then Patty became, she's a real person, she became involved in Operation Mincemeat, which was a, 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 a scheme to deceive the Germans about where the British, the Allies were going to land in the south of Europe when they invite, they, you know, D-Day and, and all of those uh, landings. So uh, with her story, because it was an operation, it was far more plot driven. And uh, as far as she went as a character, I really had, I mean, the real woman is so wonderful. And I, I really don't know if she ever put a foot wrong, you know, when she got married and had to leave the service. Uh, her husband was accused of putting back the war effort because they were so sorry to lose her. <laughs> uh, and so I really had to manufacture a conflict, a personal journey for her. Uh, and so, yes, be, the demands of the story dictate whether it's plot heavy or, 
or but I, I, I like to, uh, the characters really come to me when I start writing them on the page and their dialogue and everything just sort of comes out. Uh, I don't do lots of character studies and things like that beforehand. I find that a waste of time because once once they appear on the scene and they're given a challenge, that's when they come alive for me. Uh, so I hope that even though that book is more plotty, <laughs> I still have engaging characters who, who grow and change throughout the book. Hmm. That's very interesting to me because, yeah, that's sort of like um, that character work before writing is very it's very tricky, right? Because uh, I think for me, anyway, when when you start a project, you kind of want the character not to be fully fleshed out because you want them to have room to grow <laughs> and to experience yeah. conflicts and things that are going to change them and expand them. And so, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, in terms of like your body of work, do you have a time of peer uh, a, a time period rather that you uh, like writing about the most, or one that you find the most challenging to write about? I think they all have their challenges. Uh, I I really enjoyed writing about the 18th century. Uh, it's it's not a, a an era that uh, is as popular with readers. I think because it's just that little bit too far removed from modern day. But uh, it took me about a year to research. It, it takes me about a year to research and feel comfortable in a particular era. Uh, and it used to be that I thought, oh, I can't write in any other era, but of course you can. <laughs> you just have to do all the research and really immerse yourself in the period. And I think that's why I really like to sort of have it in, in my DNA before I start writing a novel so that, you know, I mean, to the extent where I will read contemporary fiction of the time uh, because I find there are a lot of things that aren't in history books that are in the novels that people wrote at the time mm -hmm. uh, because it's very hard. You know, history books are very fact-based and event-based and they might not say what people had for breakfast. So, And even books that purport to say what people had for breakfast, you know, they uh, if you think about it, fashions in food change so rapidly you saying that people had something for breakfast for an entire era is probably not accurate anyway. Mm. So I, I find that if I immerse myself in the period, then I'm really, I've got that basis to, to be really confident and, um, and write about it. But I can, I can find something to interest me in any period because it's the people mm. I find endlessly fascinating all the characters from from history mm. I'm really curious about the earlier stuff you know when you're writing the 18th century I imagine um you know especially when you're writing about women you're going to have to kind of turn to alternative history sources like novels because you know we're talking about a time period where women were still kind of largely excluded from the official narratives of history you know is that something that you find as well that it's particularly challenging for uh writing about women Yes, I think so. And a lot of women who did amazing things didn't get to write about them. But you do find some diaries and letters. I mean, they were prolific letter writers. So perhaps the minutiae of the day, their days were uh, covered in more detail than perhaps they would be today. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's what amazes me is is how contemporary they they feel when you read things in their words and and they really speak across the centuries i mean mary wollstonecraft is a great example she she was writing about the rights of women but also from a very personal standpoint and and <laughs> i read mary wollstonecraft and uh the female eunuch by Jermaine Greer side by side. Mm. And it is amazing and depressing how little much has changed <laughs> over two centuries. Mm. Wow. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, what are you, what's on the horizon for you? I know, you know, sometimes it's hard for authors to talk about what's coming, but uh, what sort of 
uh, what sort of things are you researching at the moment, maybe, let's say? <laughs> oh, no, I can talk about it. it uh, the next book is going to be this time next year uh, release, probably, and it's tentatively titled The Paris Gown, and it's about three women who uh, have a, share a Paris, <laughs> sorry, a Dior gown. Mm. Uh, so it's 1950s Paris, this one, so it's after the war, and uh, everybody's really keen to get back into glamour and uh Yes, it's been a really fun one to write because it's all about the female relationships in that book, uh, but it's it's got a background of McCarthyism and all of that kind of thing, which was being carried over to Paris um, in the U.S. Embassy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, that's that's the next book. Well, that sounds fantastic. I'm very excited for that one, too. Thank you so much for joining us and for writing these wonderful books. <laughs> Oh, thank you very much for having me, Jen. It's been a pleasure. Okay, listeners, please check out The Royal Windsor Secret. It's available right now. Go to your favorite independent bookstore, library, wherever you like to get your books and check it out. Thank you so much for joining us. It is now time to close this chapter. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.